If you were to ask any rail fan about what the 1960s were like for the railways, they would probably get instant PTSD from how horrible that decade was for the railways. In the 1960s, railway ridership was at an all-time low. People began to view the railways as a slow and an outdated method of transportation, while cars and international air travel, on the other hand, were quickly rising in popularity, due to the aftermath of the Second World War, where they became more accessible and affordable for the public. For a while, it seemed like that the Iron Horse would end up suffering the same fate as its predecessors 150 years ago. But in 1964, that would all change. On the 1st of October 1964, Japan launched a new train called the Shinkansen, a high-speed rail service connecting the two major Japanese cities of Tokyo and Osaka with trains that are capable of a speed of 130 miles per hour. This train would then jumpstart a new generation of trains called high-speed rail. The concept of high-speed rail itself was nothing new. It was a concept that existed all the way back to the start of the 20th century, and railways around the world had already experimented with fast trains such as the American Streamliners and the British A4 Pacifics in the 1930s. But despite having a concept that was nothing new, the world became obsessed with this new kind of train, and it didn't take long for other countries to begin developing their own high-speed trains. France, Germany, Italy, and even America were all getting into the high-speed craze. And with the arrival of the 1970s, Britain was also getting interested in high-speed rail. And little did they know, they would create a train that would turn into a laughing stock. This is the story of the advanced passenger train. <laughs> Now if you thought that railways around the world were bad enough in the 1960s, the railways in Britain were… really bad. In 1948, the railways in Britain were nationalised to create one state-owned organisation called British Railways. But the company is not celebrating, however, because as soon as British Railways was formed, it was immediately thrown into chaos. Passenger numbers were declining as more and more people were preferring to drive. Steam locomotives were still in use well into the late 1960s, as British Rail's new locomotives that intended to replace them were prone to frequent breakdowns. And entire main lines remained unelectrified until the 1970s due to the failure of the modernisation plan of 1955. So yeah, Britain's railways was in a horrible state, and it was clear that British Rail needed to fix this fast. So in the 1970s, British Rail's passenger business division studied the slight increase in British Rail's ridership thanks to the success of the Class 55 Deltics on the East Coast Main Line and the fast electric locomotives on the West Coast Main Line. So they concluded in a report which basically said that, yeah, we can compete with Rodonair as long as we can create trains that could go really fast. They then saw the success of the Shinkansen in Japan, so they decided to create a high-speed train of their own. The APT was born. So British Rail's solution to their problem was solved. They just needed a high-speed train. But there was another problem. Thanks to the low passenger numbers, income was very low, so there wasn't really enough money to construct a dedicated high-speed railway line. And with a certain individual in power of Britain at the time, it was highly unlikely that that certain someone would be willing to throw away money at a new railway line. So British Rail would instead run their new high-speed trains on conventional railway lines. More specifically, the West Coast Main Line. But then there was another problem. The West Coast Main Line was 
really old, containing a lot of tight curves and twists and turns that would make it impossible for trains to travel at high speeds. But then British Rail had a delightfully devilish idea. Delightfully devilish, Seymour. Why not just make the train tilt? Now this is gonna get nerdy, so bear with me. So unlike Japan, where they tilted the rails into turns, known as super elevation, a traditional but expensive and time-consuming construction method with Japanese rail, the APT would instead incorporate a system of hydraulic cylinders in each coach that would quickly drive the coaches to a tilting angle to the left or to the right whenever the train approached a curve. This in turn keeps the lateral forces inside the passenger coaches at a comfortable level, and it would also mean that the train wouldn't have to slow down when it approached curves, unlike a regular conventional train. So in 1964, British Rail dispersed a couple of research groups to the new research division at Derby, where a man by the name of Alan Wickens would be in charge. Alan Wickens, who used to be an aerodynamics expert, was a very successful engineer for British Rail. Earlier in the 1960s, he was tasked to sort out a hunting oscillation problem of freight cars, and he fixed this problem in 1964 by creating a high-speed freight car with a suspension that included two vertical coil springs and hydraulic dampers at each corner. Now on that same year, he and his team was tasked by British Rail to construct a full-fledged tilting high-speed train. So he and his team got to work. In November 1966, Alan Wickens sent a report to British Rail asking them to allow Wickens and his team to create a two-year program of the construction of an experimental high-speed passenger vehicle. The plan was that Wickens and his team would create a single passenger coach with two bogies at each end. That's a chassis that carries the wheels, not an actual bogey from your nose. Child. As well as two single bogies, the passenger car would include the proposed tilting mechanism for the APT, to see how would the tilting mechanism and suspension work in a full set of a train. However, the program organiser Mike Newman stepped in and noted that a single passenger car wouldn't really work if he wanted to see how the tilting mechanism and suspension would work in a full set of a train. So the plans for a single test car was dropped, and on that same month on November 1966, Newman and Wickens decided to create a complete experimental train set instead. Later, Sidney Jones was put in charge to design the experimental train. The experimental train would be designed with a top speed of 250 km an hour. The train would also be designed to round curves and corners 40% faster than what Alan Wickens originally proposed. And finally, the train would have four cars in total, two passenger cars and two power cars placed in each end of the train. The power cars would be powered by an experimental gas turbine engine built by Leyland, called the Leyland 2S-350 gas turbine, which can produce 300 horsepower. A fifth turbine would also be added, which was connected to a generator which would power the tilting mechanism in the passenger cars. Finally, in late 1971, the experimental train set was completed with massive fanfare, and it was officially named as the APTE, the Advanced Passenger Train Experimental. On the 25th of July 1972, the APTE made its first test run with a low-speed test from Derby to Duffield. However, there was already a problem with the train. The unions. Immediately after the APTE finished its test run, the Ace Left Train Driver Union refused to allow any of their members from driving the train. And why did they forbid their members from driving the APTE? Well, it was because it only had one operator's chair in it. Now you may be thinking, oh it's just a fucking sheet, the nerve of these unions, who the fuck do they think they are? Well think about it, this is an experimental test train, anything wrong could happen with it, the engine might explode, anything. And if I was to be the only person driving this thing with no one else in the cab, I would definitely be slightly concerned. So you know what? Good on Ace Lev. Strikes are good. I'm left wing. Hashtag vote Labour. <laughs> anyway, eventually, on that same day, there's a strike, everyone's pissed, and the APTE is sent back to Derby. Luckily, however, that strike at least did make Alan Wickens and his team more aware of the issues with the APT, as they would later on discover that the APTE had quite a lot of other problems than a single chair. Because Alan Wickens and his team soon discovered that the way that the bogies were designed. <laughs> Shots up! The way that the bogies were designed made them unstable and unusable for high speed runs. So one power car was retained at the lab in Derby, while the other power car and the two passenger cars were sent to the nearby Derby works for some modification. 
The specified modifications included the stiffening of the power cars and to replace the unstable bogies with some new powered bogies with the motors removed. There was also a couple of other changes made to the train, such as an addition of a small VIP seating area in a passenger car. Priorities In August 1973, the modified APTE rolled out of Derby Works and testing resumed. For the next eight months, the APTE began a series of testing such as the suspension, braking, and performance on curves. However, say it with me now, there, there was some, some problems. problems. Despite the APTE being modified in Derby Works, there were still some problems, most notably its reliability. So the APTE was sent back to Derby Works again for another overhaul. For the second overhaul, Allen's team demanded that the turbines would add additional power to the traction motors rather than just delivering power to the passenger cars. While at that same time, they also demanded that all of the turbines would be replaced with upgraded 350 horsepower turbines. This overall improved the horsepower of each power cars from 1,200 to 1,650 horsepower. After the second overhaul was completed in June 1975, testing began again, and this time, the APTE would finally prove itself to be really successful. The APTE had set a speed record by reaching a speed of 152.3 miles per hour between Swindon and Reading. It also set another speed record on the 30th of October 1975 after it completed a journey on the Midland Main Line from Leicester to London St Pancras in just 58 minutes at an average speed of 101 miles per hour. And yet another speed record was made after the APTE ran at a speed of 143.6 miles per hour on the old Derby test track. Finally, after completing many successful test runs and covering a total of 23,500 miles, the APTE was retired in 1976, and today it is now preserved in the National Railway Museum in York. So then, now that the APTE had run its course and it was proven to be quite successful, for the most part anyways, it was now time to create the vinyl version of the APT and get it into passenger service. The final version of the APT, named the APTP, would include a lot of changes from the APTE. Firstly, the APTP would be electric rather than diesel, and more weirdly, the APTE wouldn't have power cars placed in each end of the train, but more rather, having two power cars in the middle of the train. Now the reason for this is very complicated, very technical, very nerdy, very boring, so I'll try to explain this as, as simple as I can. So the reason why the APTP would have power cars in the middle was to do with the fact that the power lines in the West Coast mainline created large waves of electricity when trains travelled over 120 miles per hour, which was a serious problem for a single train with pentagraphs at both ends. So instead of trying to use a single pentagraph at the front or back and send the power running between the passenger cars because of safety concerns, the team decided to add two power cars back to back in the middle of the train. The power cars would be designed to be completely identical, and both would carry a pentagraph. But to solve the electric wave issue and avoid damage to the electrical equipment, only one of the two engines would have its pentagraph raised, and the other would keep its pentagraph down, and would have electricity fed through a coupling on the roof. However, as good as it was that the two middle power cars solved the electric wave issue, another problem was made. Although the power cars did have a corridor, it was way too noisy, cramped, and dangerous for passengers to walk through. So as a result, the train would be split into separate areas, each with its own buffet coach and toilets. Despite this issue, however, construction for the APTP trains went ahead, and the government agreed to pay 80% of the cost for a total of eight trains, although this was reduced to just three units due to budget cuts. Finally, in May 1979, the first APTP train was completed after a series of delays and pushbacks, with the first power car and passenger coaches being delivered between long periods of time from 1977 to 1978. At first, the first APTP train was quite a success, setting a speed record at 162.2 miles per hour during its first test run in December of 1979. And then, the next two units were delivered by the end of 1979 and early 1980. Now you may be thinking that the APTP trains would surely have a successful revenue service, right? Well, that delay in production of the first unit was just the tip of the iceberg. 
because as the 1980s began to roll around, the madness had begun. By the 1980s, despite having a large number of successful tests, the APT was still not in revenue service, and people began to grow impatient. The press began to constantly pressure the management of British Rail to just get the damn thing into service. The pressure from the press would then later on turn into political pressure, and then that would turn into management pressure. Basically, everyone was getting quite pissed. And in 1981, the APT team was told to get the APTs into passenger service. However, little did they know that this would be a big mistake. The reason why the APTs were still not in passenger service was due to a large number of technical issues found in the units. Due to the long periods of delays during production of the next batch of APTs, the brake blocks had been stored way longer than what they had originally intended to. The cylinder components also broke apart during storage despite having them covered in an anti-corrosion coating due to a change from oil to a water glycol mix. As a result, the weak cylinders repeatedly kept failing during testing, and it caused the train to speed up and slow down much slower due to a loss of pressure from the cylinders. There was also a bunch of other problems in the APTs, such as the compressed air systems for the doors failing to work due to an air piping problem that caused water to collect instead of condensing. The APTs were practically already falling apart. But it wasn't just the trains that were causing problems, but it was also the lines that they were built for. The West Coast Main Line wasn't exactly built with an intention for a tilting train, as the team would soon discover that parts of the Main Line had been built in a way that if one coach in the train had their tilting mechanism failed and stuck in the inward tilted position, it would strike another APTP train passing by if the tilting mechanism on that train experienced the same problem as the other. So not only were the APTPs already falling apart, they were also built to run on a Main Line that wasn't even built for tilting trains in the first place. By the 7th of December 1981, despite its large number of technical problems, the development team eventually gave in to the pressure and put the first APT train into service, with a run from London Houston to Glasgow Central, with none of the technical issues fixed. Thinking that the pressure had finally died down, little did the development team know that the negative backlash would only grow worse. During the journey, the press and the passengers that were invited on board spotted a lot of problems on the train. Most notably was that the passengers would experience motion sickness from the tilting system. A British Rail engineer tried to dismiss these claims by saying that the passengers were just drunk after drinking too much of the free alcohol that was served on board, but that never really worked. On the next day, the problems on the train only got worse as in the next day of operation, the tilting mechanism in one coach failed and it was stuck in an outward position. Then two days later, the temperature in the train dipped, causing the water in the brakes to freeze, and the train was forced to terminate at crew as a result. After the four day long shit show of mechanical failures, the press began to focus on lots of negative reporting on the APT. The press were basically taking the piss out of it and dubbing it the Queasy Rider and the Accident Prone Train. British Rail desperately tried to get the APT into good publicity. One of the most notable and comedic ways they did was that they hired a former Blue Peter presenter, Peter Purves, to take a ride on the APT for a promotional film called London to Glasgow. In the film, Peter described the ride as being smooth and quiet and a delightful experience, despite the fact that shutters were visible and dishes were rattling. British Rail even gave the APT its own theme song. Despite these attempts, it wasn't enough to suppress the backlash, and so in late 1981, a man by the name of John Mitchell took over as manager of the APT, and he immediately started to make some improvements to the trains. And then came one final blow. In mid-1984, British Rail quietly sent the modified APTs back into passenger service. So quietly, in fact, that it wasn't even announced on the timetables, 
so passengers would have to only guess if they were taking an APT if one arrived at a station. Luckily, the newly modified trains had worked quite well and no more technical issues were reported. Plans were put in place to create another batch of APTs called the APTS, a batch of trains that would have been capable of a speed of 140 miles per hour. However, due to our wonderful world of British politics, the plans were scrapped. Despite the APTs finally performing well in passenger service, pressure amongst the British Rail higher-ups to abandon the APTs entirely was gradually growing, as the APTs' rival, the Intercity 125 HST sets, were proving to be more successful, as they were able to operate across the entirety of the British Railway network with its diesel-powered engines and slower speeds. Support for the APT gradually plummeted, and eventually, in the winter of 1985, British Rail finally gave in, and the APT service was permanently abandoned. And so ends the nearly 30-year long run of the advanced passenger train. Today, only one APTP train set is now in preservation at the Crew Heritage Centre. The APTP may not have lasted into the 21st century unlike its rival, but its legacy still lives on. After the APTP train sets were withdrawn in the mid-1980s, its design would jumpstart tilting trains around the world such as the ETR 401. In Britain, the APT made a slight comeback on the East Coast mainline with a similar tilting train called the Intercity 225, which it wasn't exactly intended to be a tilting train, but it did incorporate technology from the APT. And in 1999, tilting trains would eventually return to the West Coast mainline with the introduction of the more successful Class 390 Pendolinos, which are still in service today. So in conclusion, the advanced passenger train may not have seen the success British Rail had originally hoped thanks in part to the wonderful world of the media and British politics. But at the very least, it is acknowledged as one of the most important milestones of high-speed trains development. It created an entirely new generation of tilting high-speed trains, and it saved Britain's railways from what seems like an inevitable downfall. So in a way, we should all be thankful for the existence of the APT.